call this meeting to order. Please stand for the invocation given by Councilmember Briggs and silence your cell phones, please. Please join me in the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Public comment? Each speaker should have signed up in advance with the city clerk. Each speaker will please use the podium. Please state your name and address before beginning your statement. You'll be limited to five minutes. Please address your comments to the chair. Council will not engage in debate with the speaker. On the first bell, you have 30 seconds left. Please wrap it up, because on the second bell, we'll have to stop. Bob Gray. My name is Bob Gray, uh, 8922 Fargo Road, Stafford, New York. I come before the city council tonight as a representative of the Friends of the Rink organization. Uh, to request your support of the city manager's proposed resolutions concerning her recommendations for replacement of the ice rink chiller. Uh, the current ice rink chiller was installed in 2006 as a replacement for the original unit installed in 1978 when the rink building was constructed. All rink user groups require the same thing to administer their programs, ice. If the rink operator lacks the ability to make and maintain that ice, they might as well close and lock the doors because they are out of business. This is how vital an ice rink chiller is to the operation of an ice rink. The rink's hockey season starts from Labor Day through the month of March. A typical Sunday consists of the Batavia Men's Hockey League games from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. This group has been in existence for 45 years. From 1 to 3 p.m. is open skate, family skate, which is well received. Late afternoon until 8 p.m. consists of a youth hockey game, and these games bring in competing teams from, and families from out of the area. A typical weekday features open skates from 11.30 to 1, which this year hosted many homeschool students as part of their physical education program. At 5 p.m., youth hockey practices begin until 9.30 p.m. Then the ice is made available for pickup hockey teams. On Friday night from 7 to 9 is open public skate. A typical Saturday begins at 8 a.m. with a beginner hockey program, and the rest of the day sees games again with visiting teams from the Buffalo and Rochester area. From November 15th to February 15th, the BND United High School team is added to the mix, bringing revenue to lo local restaurants, fuel, and retail locations, a win-win for the local economy of Batavia. All of this is possible because of the rink's ice chiller. The 2018 multi-sport complex feasibility study, which was completed as part of the Creek Park project stated the current rink had an average of 68,000 visits a year and contributed an estimated $2.3 million a year to the local economy. This was without hockey tournaments being held as in the past, except for the David McCarthy High School uh, tournament held in December and a very limited number of summer events being scheduled. This is now changing. Several hockey tournaments are being planned, and during this off-season, additional events are being held to increase revenue. Extreme international ice racing was held with motorcycles racing on the ice. This was a sold-out event with 500 tickets sold and spectators three to four deep at the Dasher Boards. Uh, Batavia Youth Spell Baseball held a Tri Baseball for Free event for children four to nine uh, to recruit players for the local program. Genesee County Youth Bureau held a family game night and a free roller skating session afterwards. The event consisted of interactive booths with activities, games, and prizes for families and organizations which serve youth. 
Some are roller hockey and floor hockey are back at the rink. On Friday, July 7th, the rink is holding an 80 and 90 skating party for those 21 and over, complete with the people's ID, Mike Calandra, disco mood lighting, and legal refreshments. When this event was posted on the rink's Facebook page, it gathered 500 shares, meaning that they shared it with another person, and 75 positive comments. There is a lot of interest. On Sunday, July 16th, Pro Wrestling comes to the McCarthy for the Mayhem at the McCarthy event. Informational rack cards are on the table if you're interested. On August 5th and 6th, the McCarthy Market Mega Garage Sale will be held at the rink from 9 a.m. to 4 on both days. Information is available by calling the rink at 585-250-4040. In closing, I would like to extend an invitation to host uh, council members on a tour at the rink at their convenience to show what rink improvements have been made since last August 1st and what additional improvements are planned this season and to answer any questions they may have concerning the rink operation. Thank you. John Roach. John Roach, Grandview Terrace, City of Batavia. Uh, just to kind of follow up on that, as long as City Council's decided that the city will own and operate an ice rink, uh, the chillers are no brain. No chiller, no ice rink. So it's nice to know you're thinking about doing it, but it's got to be replaced. The other thing I would like to uh, bring up is the questionnaire, uh, City of Batavia residents, uh, for the grant. Is there any way the uh, IT department can make this a little more user friendly. Uh, you go online, you got to print it out, just mail it in, walk it in, whatever. Uh, when the county does these type of surveys, you can do it right online, just fill in everything, hit submit, uh, like a lot of other forms and questionnaires. I think you'd get a lot better results with these uh, surveys if you had that option. It's, like myself, I don't feel like printing it out, then filling it out and walking it in or mailing it in. So I think you'd get a lot better response if you did that. Thank you. Tim Sprague. Tim Sprague, 210 Narrow Drive, Batavia. Uh, I'm also here in support of the rink project and the upgrades that are needed. I wanted to give a little bit uh, of a background on Batavia Ramparts. Uh, so I guess I'm here as their representative. I currently serve as the VP on the board. I'm also the VP of Western New York Hockey uh, for the Batavia organization. Currently, we've got about 200 kids at play uh, for the Ramparts, various levels, anywhere from beginners uh, right up through 18U hockey. Incredibly successful, successful season last year. We had tournaments we won in Utica, we won league tournaments, we won league championships. Very, very positive vibe we got going on with the rink right now. I was fortunate enough that I grew up playing hockey. I uh, grew up playing Batavia Ramparts. Uh, I was able to play for both Notre Dame and Batavia High School. The rink means a lot to my family and myself. Uh, when I was 16 years old, my mom passed away. Hockey really got me through kind of that next couple of weird years of, of life. You know, being a kid without a parent, growing up on Harvester Avenue, it was really helpful to have a place where I could go where my friends were, they were like family, and I was able to be a part of that hockey community. The spirit behind the, the Batavia Ramparts right now, the vibe, the buzz, the people who have come back, it's amazing. I would recommend anybody come down and take a look at just what's going on there. We've had the Empire State Torch come in. We're, I'm currently working on a, a tournament uh, this year with our mites. That would be our eight and under kids that, that will bring a couple hundred families probably to Batavia throughout that weekend. You know, we, we could have as many as eight teams. They'll, they'll be in and out of the rink doors. They'll be in and out of local restaurants. They'll, they'll be spending money here in Batavia. And then kind of another thing that I, that I always thought was really interesting, we moved back to Batavia in 2014. Um, I got involved with hockey with my with my son when he started playing beginners. A lot of families that are in that are using that rink, we're pulling from all over Genesee County. So it's not just it's not just local area people that are using it. It's it's driving from all around and it's pulling people into our community. And you're getting to see things that are happening at the rink. 
I, I honestly, the, the dirt bike thing I thought was, was a wild idea. Couldn't believe how successful it was. To see that happen on ice and the amount of support that that received was just really cool. Um, but from a Batavia Rampart standpoint, uh, we're looking at growing. When I grew up playing, we had significantly more families, significantly more ice time used. Uh, the program kind of took us a dip. Now it's coming back up. And I just really think with the support of keeping the rink up and keeping things going, we can, we can grow even more and we'll, we'll double that number in the next three, four, five years of what we currently have with 200 kids. So that's just all I really want to say is just the support that Batavia Ramparts has for that rink and what it means to us. So thank you, appreciate it. Council response? Paul? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Grays for what they're doing for the rink. And I have first-hand experience going in the rink because I have both my sons play high school hockey. So I'm doing a hell of a job. Um, it's, it's like day and night compared to what it was before. So the, they have my full support. And what can we do to expedite this grant for them? Um, specifically, the grant has timeline parameters, so I'm going to go through it in the presentation, but we have a choice to make tonight to approve a $2.5 million project and have council look at the two different scenarios of bonding and investment, one with a grant and one without. My ask tonight is actually to approve it, not knowing whether we get the grant or not, by letting you know we do have sufficient funds in the general fund to make those bond payments. So again, we wouldn't know about the grant until December if council chooses to, one, approve the capital project, and two, to apply for this grant. So it's kind of like we need to get started now to hit the April timeline of when the ice comes up to move forward with the chiller replacement. So we can do something tonight to move it along? Or? Yeah, to business, I mean. Okay. But I think we, we're gonna have a very long financial conversation after the presentation. But Bob Gray really did my whole presentation, so I don't know if I, Matt and I need to get up there. <laughs> I just wanna say that the, the excitement and the passion that you hear in the speakers um, is real and, and I wouldn't know it personally because I've not been over there. Um, my, my kids are older now, they don't, they don't go to the rink for anything anymore. Uh, but I have a number of drum students who are involved in hockey locally and I'm talking to the parents every week and they're going, it's unbelievable what's going on over there. You know, it's like a whole different place. And so you're seeing the excitement we're hearing tonight from the speakers is real. It's, it's, it, it has infected everybody there now. So, um, yeah, we're on to something. Let's keep the ball rolling. So. Well, yeah, I, I think it's just a testament to local control. Local people doing what's best for the community and local control. They're accountable to the community, their friends, their neighbors. It's great. I mean, we, unfortunately, we didn't do this years ago. Well, I'll concur with what everybody said. You can, you can tell the excitement and the passion from all your speakers out there, and we appreciate you coming. Uh, but what Mr. Roach brought up about the online thing, that okay. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, go ahead. We're, we're researching it. That, that form was actually provided to us from the state, so we're looking to see if we can, we've reached out to Labella, we haven't heard back from them. They're researching it to see if it is something that we can alter for that purpose, because we have gotten that feedback as well. Because I think there's a signature portion on it, if I could add yeah. to that, Eric. Right. So sometimes the granting agency wants an original signature on it and they were up in the air whether they'd accept the online form or not. So we're working on it, and we still have three, four weeks July to get July 7th, they're due from? Which really means July 14th. Everybody? So yes. Um, I just want to say the ice rink is unbelievable. I've been there since the, the change, and, it, and like Bob said, it's because you guys, the families, took ownership of it and started working towards where we're at now. And it's it's only getting better every day. So thank you for all the effort you guys put into it. And it's led and it's dominoed into better and bigger things. And hopefully we can get this chiller thing resolved so that we can continue on. 
with all the service that that, that rink provides to the community. Um, that's just an example of if people get involved and stay involved, things will be successful. It's just that simple. Um, communications. Chicasa requested to hold <clears throat> their Overdose Awareness Day on Wednesday, August 30th in Austin Park from 4 to 7 p.m. It's an awareness event. They will have speakers, resource tables, and a live band. Any questions or concerns on that? Okay. Next City Council meeting will be held Monday, July 10th, 2023, 7 p.m., City Hall Council Boardroom, second floor, City Center, and that will be a business meeting. Is that going to be a combo? Yes, it is. So it'll be the business and conference because we only have one meeting in July and one meeting in August. Correct. So, okay. We have two presentations. Going to need that? Yep. We do. Sorry to make you move. <laughs> Who designed this? <laughs> We're supposed to be able to see this presentation. Watch your eyes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, members of council, council president. If you guys want to step up, um, introduce you to our school resource officers, Officer, officer Maya Stevens, Officer Connor Borkin. Uh, as you know, we've entered into an agreement with the uh, Batavia City School District to provide school resource officers, and last year we had a second, which Maya certainly appreciates, and liking her load a little bit. Um, but they're, they're very, very busy individuals um, with a lot going on at the school. They did a presentation to the uh, district themselves, and I thought that we would present this to City Council just so you guys have a very good understanding of what they do on a daily basis. So they're going to go into just a five, eight minute presentation, correct? Right? Yes. All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Chief said, we were asked to do a presentation for the Board of Education um, just to kind of give an overall summary of what we do. It definitely covers a lot. Like Chiefs also said, I am very appreciative that we have a second SRO. <laughs> it uh, definitely lightens the workload. So we started off by just describing what an SRO was. Um, so as you can see up here, it says, an SRO is in a carefully selected, specifically trained, properly equipped law enforcement officer with sworn authority, trained in school-based law enforcement and crisis response. Um, usually the employing agencies, our agency being the city of Batavia, collaborates with the school as such that he just said with our contract um, and definitely like it says up there using more community oriented policing. We receive annual training through the New York State Juvenile Officers Association. Um, the trainings have been in the past been held in Lake George and Syracuse so we usually get to travel for them. They're a week-long training and they also just give us a refresher on um, certain juvenile laws that maybe weren't publicly or, or maybe we hadn't heard about. They just kind of keep us up to date on what's going on. So the roles of an SRO, um, the goals of a well-founded SRO program include providing safe learning environments in our nation's schools, providing valuable resources to school staff members, fostering positive relationships with youth, developing strategies to resolve problems affecting youth and protecting all students so they can reach their fullest potentials. 
Um, so we got this right off one of the school resource uh, officer um, websites. So the best practice is the triad concept and it's defined in three uh, main roles. Um, so we're educators, we're informal counselors and mentors, and at the end of the day, we're always law enforcement officers. So combining those three with many more uh, traits, which we do on a daily basis, um, that's, that's what a school resource officer does. And I will say now that I have been to a couple school resource officer trainings over the years, this triad concept is what they use in every single training. Um, so different events that we participate in, different things like open houses, careers in candy, um, Jackson and John Kennedy usually have uh, people from DPW, Sheriff's Department, uh, the Fire Department, us, and they just do a whole bunch of things. Just we come dressed in our costumes and the kids get to come, they get to like trick or treat with us and we'll hand out some candy to them. Uh, we participate in a shop with our cop event. This one personally is my favorite. Um, I've gotten more heavily involved over the past couple of years. Uh, but the school helps us get all of the students for that. Um, usually, Julie Wazalewski will, I'll send a list out, or she'll send a list out to me, and then we'll contact the parents and just ask them if it's something they willing to, they want to be interested in. Um, we have our polar plunge. This was a big thing this year uh, to benefit the Special Olympics. It's really big in Monroe County and has heavy law enforcement involvement. Family reading nights, um, usually more popular with our younger students, but we did have one at the middle school this year. Uh, usually we've done guest readers. We've been the guest readers in the classroom. We've done Thanksgiving food drives, so the middle school and JK will go through and collect food uh, over the month before Thanksgiving, and then usually the day before we go on Thanksgiving break, we will deliver the food to the families. Uh, recently, bike, or, uh, oh, I'm sorry, skipped one. Bike raffles, our PBA, um, our Police Benevolent Association usually donates a couple bikes that we get to bring to the schools that they usually um, raffle off in their family reading nights. We also participated in the Galasanos Hospital Toy Drive. This was specific with JK this year, um, where same thing as the Thanksgiving Food Drive. They have kids bring in toys, ask for any donations, and then they deliver them to the hospital themselves. Uh, community Night Out, this is obviously the biggest event for our department. Um, we get a lot of community involvement in that, and I think some people have probably been in the past, our administrators at the school district actually participate with us, usually in the dunk tank. <laughs> um, and then recently we just had the Lions Club Day of Caring Bike Donation, where the Lions Club fixed up, fixed up a bunch of bikes, and then we partnered with the school to get those bikes to children of the community. Um, and something we told them, we're always looking for more ways to strengthen the connections with students in the community. That's certainly what makes our job easier. So if anybody has any requests or ideas for us, please feel free. So some extracurricular events. Uh, Maya and I, we went to most of the sporting events this year and we like to split them up. Sometimes there's three on one night, sometimes there's only one on one night. But some of the sporting events that we did, football's a big one, uh, soccer, volleyball, wrestling, basketball, hockey, lacrosse, flag football, baseball, softball, and track and field. Um, just a point around the sporting events. Uh, we did host sectionals for track and field and also the state qualifying. Uh, so those were two massive events uh, for the city of Batavia and over at Vendetta there. We also do uh, school dances, sports banquets, school plays and musicals, uh, the Miss Batavia competition, and any graduations, whether it's from uh, high school level or even down to a Jackson level. These are all a different uh, different types of incidents, what, in our police language, what we would call them. Um, just different types of calls. Really being in the school, you know, when people ask me what we do, I, I always tell them we're essentially road cops just placed in the school. The school is our jurisdiction now. So anything we would handle on the road, we have the potential to handle it in school. And with a lot of these students coming from you know, from home, right, the day before or the morning of, a lot of times they bring some issues with them. And then it does become a school issue. Um, so like I said, I mean, I won't read every single one out for you, but there's just a broad range of things that we can cover. 
I'm going to also take this one because I can personally attest to why having a second SRO was better. Um, more coverage over all the schools. Last year, I can attest that having four schools for one person is a lot. Um, a lot of students to remember, a lot of ground to cover. Adding a fifth school this year kind of threw us for a little loop, but it's worked out great. We love it there. You can dedicate more time to each individual school district or in individual school building. So I take the middle school and Jackson and Robert Morris, and then Connor will take the high school and JK. And just kind of having separate faces, you know, the kids sometimes will cross over and we'll meet at different events, but the kids will get to know both of us. It's also allowed each one of us to know more about each school. So not just talking about each student and staff and all of their names and faces, but also what build, what like building quirks there are. You know, which doors in the summertime are more likely to get stuck? Which one should we keep a closer eye on? <laughs> it's true. Well, and in all honesty, too, security is a big thing right now with everything going on. So you know. Sending reminders out to teachers, hey, make sure you're checking this door, make sure you're closing the doors behind you when you leave. Um, and like I said, increased knowledge about staff and students. You, you just get to know people more. People have been more willing to come to me with specifically with information, and I know the same, same as for Connor. Um, more feasible, feasible workload. This is huge for me. Um, Last year, I, I loved my job last year, but it definitely was very overwhelming. I think by March, I was calling the chief and <laughs> saying, I think something needs to change with this, because this is very difficult. Um, so it's just kind of made it easier. Reports, um, and like he said, all the sporting events, those cross over three seasons, and usually we get about a month in between each season. So for pretty much the majority of the school year, we're running around. <laughs> um, we've also gained a lot more community policing events. We're able to work more directly with the school and they've actually helped us build a lot better relationship with the community. Um, I think I covered that last one, but the more positive interactions with staff and students, I mean, I can attest to that personally. Just the more interactions that I've had with people around the city is, has grossly impressed from last year. So we just have some goals listed up here for the 23-24 SRO program. Um, increased classroom lessons. This goes to being DARE certified. I am not DARE certified, but Maya is. Um, so I was, their program's up there. Um, the I Love, I Love You Guys Foundation, it's a standard response proto protocol. Um, the pamphlet's there to the right. That's just for any event where we might need to go into lockdown, lockout, whatever it might be. It's all listed right there, just in simpler terms. And then continue to enhance uh, proactive communication between the school district and the police department and the community. Uh, we have great communication, but continuing to be able to do that even on a, you know, a future basis is something that's definitely going to build the SRO program even greater than it is. Um, and down there is the Genesee County Threat Assessment Management Team. Um, that's just for, I guess, if a teacher or a, a administrator or even us we see you know kids struggling with something we can bring it to this board um, I think you can touch on a little bit better yeah uh, the, the threat assessment team basically it's it's for all of Genesee County it also goes for businesses and it, the school it's pretty much for any community member so um, if businesses are having an issue with an, um, an ex-employee or, or a situation that you know they're a little bit more concerned about it just um, coming down from New York State, it just gives everybody an extra level of something that we have, another resource for us to work with. Um, and the I Love You Guys Standard Response Protocol, that is a nationwide program that they're currently um, trying to get out. It comes specifically from the Columbine incident and the all of the language up there basically is just looking to cement that language across the board. So that this is this will be the same with businesses, it will be the same with schools, it will be the same with any other community um, place that we have that would would need to use us, I guess, in that way. These are just some pictures that we had from um, the Calasanos Children's Hospital Toy Donation. I will not take Neither of us will take credit for these pictures because we're terrible at remembering to do that, but we <laughs> so graciously other people offered up their pictures for us. 
I think the top one. Yeah, so the top one is that Lion's Day of Caring, uh, the bike um, donation. So these are actually bicycles that uh, us as a city police department have found throughout the city and if they're not claimed, the Lions Department will come and get them, fix them up, and then they will give them away to um, students. So we collaborated with the Lions Club um, and I gave um, the counselors and um, school administration at the high school a heads up and they were able to get some kids who were in need of bikes so we were able to give them those bikes away. On um, the top right there, that was just our, our press conference at the beginning of last year um, when we added the second SRO. Bottom left is the Polar Plunge, again a huge event, a lot of uh, people there, you can see the fire department truck in the back, and down there uh, was me with the shop with a uh, cop event this past December. That's it. I, I have one. Um, you said, uh, Maya, that you cover three schools and you cover the two. Now, do you do that all in one day? Or, or do you have like specific things that you need to do in each school during the week? Or? It could depend. I mean, the job changes every day. Normally, I would say the majority of our time is spent at the high school and middle school. Um, Student-wise, that's where we're probably needed the most. Um, the younger schools can we can be dealing with some other issues, but we still like to spend time there just to obviously get the students to know our faces. Um, so really, it ranges. You know, I like to spend a day at each school, but if I'm getting called somewhere else, I'll just leave that school and go to the other school and kind of on an as-needed basis. A lot of variety in your day. That's right. <laughs> it's never boring. I'm glad you got a second one. I have to. I mean, I'm saying now, you're doing three, you're doing two. It's like, my God, it's so overwhelming. Sometimes, but it's fun, so it's worth it. <laughs> you're doing a great job. Thank you. These guys are probably a couple of the busiest cops that you'll ever yeah. walk into. Probably, I don't know if they have a step, uh, you know, little step meters on their watch, but <laughs> easily 10,000, 20,000 steps yeah. in an afternoon. Definitely. So easily. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps us exercising. That's right. <laughs> Great job. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys very much. Bob really stole our thunder for the presentation, but those of you who don't know, Matt Gray, the operator of West Contagious Sports Management L yeah. LLC, yeah. <laughs> I got it, <laughs> um, and it's been a full year, so I'm going to go through some things about the rink, and I want Matt to share with everyone where he sees where the first year went, where he sees things going. Um, so, as everyone knows, the Ice Arena opened in 1978. Bob Gray is the official historian of the Ice Arena because I do get all my documents from him. Now the city is keeping better files. Um, approximately 32,000 square feet adjacent to the fire department. It's owned by the city but run by a private entity, Batavia Sports Facility Management LLC, under Matt Gray and his wonderful staff. It's home to youth, adult, high school programs. It consists of a single sheet of ice, capacity for 480 spectators, and it can be used year-round, though the ice is only down September to, to end of March. End of March. Yeah. So I'll let Matt talk to you guys just a little bit about what he's been doing this year, um, and then we'll come in and talk more about the chiller. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a great first year. Um, by many metrics, uh, we, we had a lot of the check marks we were attempting to do uh, when we set out last August. Um, I have to say that uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I'm not a HVAC guy, I'm not a, a refrigeration specialist by any means. Uh, what we do is, is, is people. Um, first thing that we did was we brought in uh, Katie Murray, uh, previously with me at Alex's place. She's a, a customer service person. Um, brought her in. We were lucky enough to retain uh, Adam Reach, uh, who's also here, so Katie and Adam. Um, Adam is the facility manager. Uh, he's been at the arena for quite a long time, so we relied heavily on him uh, for the hockey season. And 
uh, without his expertise, uh, it would have been a, a much uh, it would have been a rougher year. Uh, the, the season went well. Uh, we went through our CapEx um, plans for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth year, and we actually jumped ahead on a, a bunch of the items. So we, uh, we, we got to see <coughs> some uh, needed revamps in the uh, added a meeting room uh, with uh, uh, televideo uh, capabilities so we can start having meetings in-house now. Uh, we've uh, done some improvements to the party room. We're hosting more parties there. Uh, we have put new lighting in, uh, we switched to LED lighting, which um, the, the arena's never looked any better. It's, it, the, the lighting in there has been fantastic. Uh, and it isn't, you know, I think you've already gotten the kind of the vibe that you're from, from the speakers earlier. Uh, it's not just arena staff, it's really an entire community thing where there's an upswell and a support. Uh, all these different rink organizations that, are, that use the arena are now stepping up on days where there are projects being done and they're chipping in and they're, they're really uh, making the arena, um, honestly, it, it looks almost new again. And we love to hear people from Rochester and Buffalo come in and you, you overhear them talk about, man, I haven't been here in a little while, but this place looks fantastic. Um, one of the major goals for our plan was, was this has always been a great hockey arena, but it's a city facility and it needs to be accessible to everybody and it really needs to support the community. So we have been, you know, we have been really focusing on what other things can we do, especially in the off season, to make this a true 12 month uh, facility. This summer was a learning curve. Uh, we got a little bit of a slow start to be honest and we are getting to the point now where we have at least an event a week Next summer, we know that we're already laying out what our plan is for next year. So you have events, uh, I think we already mentioned, we have wrestling coming, we're doing adult skate nights. Uh, we partnered with the, part, uh, partnered with the uh, Jesse County Youth Bureau to uh, get a portion of the new skates that we bought, uh, donated for us to, to have more for the kids. Um, we have uh, public skate uh, each week. Um, we have a, a garage sale coming up for the community. Um, going into next season, uh, we're partnering with uh, the Buffalo Stampede, which is a junior A hockey team uh, out of Buffalo. They're going to be having two games, which for us it'd be similar to having the Muck Dogs play. It's a you know it's a semi-pro on the way to uh, pro hockey. So they're doing a Saturday night, Sunday afternoon game. Um, they're doing an open practice with us through the year, and they're also we're talking to them about possibly doing uh, skates with the kids. So they're going to bring their players in and skate with the kids. Um, we brought in some uh, special games where we uh, one of them was uh, Fire City Fire versus City Police. That was extremely entertaining. It was a great, it was a great crowd. Uh, afterwards, it was fun because we we got reached uh, we were reached out to by uh, Genesee County Sheriff's, the City of Batavia teachers. Uh, everyone wants to do something like that. So I think it's just a you know it's it's a nod to um, reaching out to more people. Once you start reaching out to more people, more people start reaching out back to you. So um, we're, we're on track, uh, we feel, to make this arena uh, truly a 12-month facility for the city and for the community. Um, so, you know, as we all know, we all know the backstory. Uh, this arena has been, you know, it doesn't owe us much. It's, it's really given a lot and we're, you know, 20-some-year-old chiller that if you don't mind, I, I, I do have to tell you, the arena itself, it struggles. Uh, our staff is doing everything they can to keep it running. Um, it's a great expense with the R22, we do have leaks. Uh, it's costing you know, our, our capital budget um, through the, the city thousands of dollars a year. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it has to be done because we're, we're losing money there. Um, on our side, our staff is going up. Um, during the, during the winter, seven times, 10 times a, a week, going up onto the roof and they're thawing out a, a, a broken uh, evaporator up on the roof. It freezes solid. It's 20 degrees out, 10 degrees out, wind's blowing. It can't wait an hour. It has, you have to go up, you have to thaw it. Otherwise you start losing the ice within like four hours. So um, we know we have a challenge for this coming year. We've already sat down with all the staff and they're up for it. Um, we need to make it through this coming season 
and we need to stick to the timetable hopefully for the 2024-2025 season so that we can open up in September of that season. So. That's, uh, that's, really that's all true. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Brett and Eric, you can jump in at any time. You've been on calls, you've been to the rink, you've helped in many ways. So as Mr. Gray mentioned, the multiple sports complex study was conducted in 2019. The children was identified then as needing replacement. We've known for a while. You've heard me say it many, many, many times over the past two years. We operate on the R22 refrigerant, which has been phased out of production. We spent over 90000 in 21 and 22. You remember the emergency purchases for either refrigerant or oil during that time period. So we built reserves. Um, however, those reserves are being flushed down into buying this um, refrigerant. So we had... Um, as folks on council recall, we're working with the New York Power Authority on this LED streetlight conversion. And because this is an item or machinery that uses energy, NYPA said, well, let us use part of your contingency on that and work with our contractor and we'll do a feasibility study. So about four months ago, we asked them, five months ago, to start the feasibility study with a goal of having it ready. It is in your packets for everyone to read. We'll make sure it's online. Um, but they absolutely recommend to replace the chiller, the evaporative cooler. So Adam, who wears a harness every time he goes on the roof, doesn't need to go up there, right? He's wearing a yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Brine pump motor and hot water recovery. So these are all the parts of the plant. Like if you think about a mechanical system inside a manufacturing plant, um, there's compressors, there's pipes, the uh, liquid runs through it and then goes under the ice mm -hmm. to chill it. So this does not include the concrete of the ice or the pipes under that concrete at this time. This is purely for the chiller. Um, they went, Rachel, yes? Those pipes underneath the ice were replaced several years ago, were they not? Mid-90s, I believe. Mid -90s, was yeah. That, was that long ago? Yeah. I do remember it. And the condition currently is okay? Those pipes have been checked because... We, uh, they hold up to pressure. Okay. Uh, it's encased in concrete, mm -hmm. so we really have no way of telling where they are. Um, it hooks up to a very, very large header, yep. uh, eight-inch pipes. Um, and it seems like everything that's inside of the room is brittle. Everything that's actually in the arena part where it goes under seems to be fairly solid steel still. So the recommendation was a CO2 system. It has a low risk of phase out. It's commercially available, so that means we can source it quicker than any other type of system. There are safety risks, but they're moderate and easily addressed. Anytime you're running any type of compression equipment like this, there are safety risks. Um, it's better for the seasonality of the rig. We have ice on for six, seven months, and then ice off, and it should increase the ice quality. It'll help us realize significant operational and maintenance savings. Obviously, we won't be paying for refrigerant anymore, for oil, those types of maintenance, um, switching to the R22. And it should have some electrical savings for the Matt's team who pays the electric bills over at the ice rink. So it does help us qualify to put in for the Climate Smart Communities grant. Um, and that is one of the measurements that we have to look at if we're going to apply for that. So I put together uh, two different financial outlooks for council to consider and have a discussion on. The first one is without any grant funds. <coughs> so we'll start out at the top. It's a $2.47 million bond. The first column is your debt year, then your fiscal year. And I want to show you the sources of revenue already committed, and I'm just assuming you're going to run for 20 years, Matt, so I'm putting your yes, revenue that's... in there. <laughs> and the naming rights revenue. So this is the revenue we have today coming into the rank. Um, on a on a year-by-year -year basis, we try to put that into reserves to build our reserves. Current reserve funds at the bottom of your page, you can see, is $375,492. Um, this schedule 
was based on 2018 interest rates, which our financial advisor advisors <coughs> might be moving into those at a 3 to 4.3 percent. So you'll see the debt payment in the next column after the after the naming rights. So that would be the total debt payment. So at the end of the life of this, with interest, it would end up costing the city $4 million unless we could buy down the debt sooner. Um, and then if I take the uh, revenue out, that's the next column, you can see the payment there. And then if we were to use reserves in the first eight years, you can see the effect to the general fund. So first year general fund effect, 75,000, 77, 99, and then it goes up from there. Um, again, only showing use of reserves for a small number of years. So I'll hold here for any questions. But again, this is the outlook for bonding the entire $2.5 million project without any grant funds coming in. Uh, thank you. <coughs> what is the expected life of the new system? So I think our system will last at least 25 to 30 years. So this would be a 25-year debt schedule. And that, and that was confirmed by Wendell, too, in the meetings. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, we'd never like to add any type of expense to the general fund that we can't find a revenue source to pay for. So by using some of that reserves, committing some of that reserves in this financial model, it, it reduces the amount we'd be taking out of the general fund and give us some time to um, either build up our sales tax and find other sources of revenue. Well, I think uh, grant or no grant, it has to be done. Yeah. It, it, and that's really the, the conversation tonight is that we need to go ahead if after council looks at all the information um, and comes back at your business meeting July 10th. We do need to go ahead because we can have the engineering done while we wait to see if we get the grant in December. So we can do that engineering part, have everything ready to order those long lead time items. I think the longest was seven or eight months, they said. So by December, we'll know what our financial picture looks like. But it is definitely doable. It's very tight. It's definitely a strain to the general fund. But I think we have a great partner there. And we're looking at other ways to bring revenue in, not only to your operations, but to the city reserves as well. Um, but I will just go through real quickly with the grant funds. This would be a $1.265 million bond. And the chart set up the exact same year with the debt year, the fiscal year, the same contributions um, from Matt's operation, the naming rights revenue. Um, and then you can see if we use reserves about $200,000, we'd have zero general fund payments if we wanted to. We could move this model around um, and we'd have very low impact to the general fund after that for the remainder of the life. So um, we're certainly hoping that this grant becomes a reality, but we can't promise ICE even after this year. I think there's a plan in place of how to get it done for one more year, mm -hmm. but we're really treading on very lightly to make sure that the season and, and the, you know the double-edged sword. Um, the the leaks continue on too. So the the longer that we're we're open, the more in R22 that we lose, we will need to buy more. So it's you know it, it, the time the, t the clock's ticking. Yeah. And it's fast yeah. out. How long will you be able to get? Right. So that's scary. I mean, it, this right. is a small investment for the community and the youth. Yeah. It, it has to be done. I agree with council person. And we can sell our R22 if there's any left. The end of the day, but it's very minuscule, so I couldn't put it a number two in our financial model. But we can actually sell whatever is left to other users of it because we get ours recycled, correct? Correct, yeah. There is no more new, uh, they stopped producing it in 2020. Yeah, my air conditioner is 30 years old and it needed a uh, cool and it needed free air. Yeah. I just had it last weekend. Yeah. And it was like three hundred dollars, and they said they don't make this anymore. I had a hard time getting it, yeah. so that's a concern to me. I mean, I didn't replace the unit, but right. I'm probably going to in the next year or two right. because I'm not going to. If it breaks again, I can't get it. Right, we're so in the same. We're in the same boat. We've got to work that out for sure. We have two hundred kids playing ramparts. You have, yeah. you have high school. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. You know, move this forward. So let's get this done. I don't know if they gentlemen need to because if something happens and it's dangerous, <laughs> well, no, that's dangerous. dangerous. But if something happens and you're taking your off, the, the dying are back the kids are going someplace else, and then they don't come back. Correct. So we can't allow them to right. We are. So, yeah, so nice. we move this through so we can discuss it when it gets on the agenda. Isn't this on the agenda to be discussed after this? You can either discuss it now or during the agenda. I'll just say the, the three resolutions before you. One is to, we had a capital project for 1.5 million, that was our first estimate, uh, back of a napkin type estimate, and now we have the real numbers. They could go down slightly if we don't use all of like, the services and all the engineering, but again, you want to plan for kind of the worst case scenario. Um, the county actually uh, came out with a letter to all municipalities and they are paying for one grant per municipality this year, and we chose this one to have the county pay for. So just recognizing that revenue um, is the second resolution, and the third is to um, apply for the Climate Smart Communities Grant. But just to be clear, once you approve the $2.5 million capital project, you're giving us management to go ahead to move forward um, with this plan. Yeah. If we use the climate smart approach, are we locked into using the, uh, the New York Power Authority? Um, right now, we're locked into using the Power Authority because it is their um, project contingency budget that, that did this, and I would recommend going with them. They provide the short term financing for us, so we don't have to pay anything until the project is completely done. They also bring in an engineering firm to source all the materials. Like our LED lights for all the neighborhoods are actually sitting in a warehouse. We're just waiting to close with National Grid. So they make the project turnkey for us. We don't have to expend a lot of time with our DPW staff. But we don't have to use the uh, power authority in order to qualify for the grant, correct? Um, no. No, you could apply for this grant without being a customer of the Power Authority, but the Power Authority has been, I would say, great to work with. Um, as a larger municipality, they bring a lot to the table, and like I said, they put everything out to bid, they hold the short-term financing, they procure it all, um, and, and they help a lot, especially with the LED project, and they've committed to do the same. I don't know what your experience is. You've been on some of the calls with Yeah, the, the, the um, you know, it's all been Zoom calls. But uh, they've been very responsive. They uh, they're surprisingly um, agreeable and proactive. Um, first state organization, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Well, they're a public authority. Public authority. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> they actually said they come tonight, and I said, eh, I think we're going to have a financial conversation, not a technical one. So, um, but they're really supportive on the technical side. It, it may help actually that their logo is on our study when we put in for it with the other state agency too, actually. Okay, so we'll leave it there and then if there's more discussion. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever have a, you know, another chance to do it. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the uh, the city staff that we work with day in and day out has been fantastic this year. Um, we really couldn't have done most of the things that we did without without these, these people here. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. 
Um, would you want me to read the whole paragraphs that I entered into the record? We don't have to do that, right? The rules for public hearing? I mean, no, I mean the actual reason for the public hearing. It's quite a long paragraph. I think we should. Okay, I'll read it real quick. Okay. City of Batavia is holding the public hearing tonight, June 26, 23, for the purpose of hearing public comments on the City of Batavia's community development needs and to discuss the possible submission of one or more community development block grant, CDB applications for 2023 program year. The CDBG program is administered by New York State Offices of Community Renewal, OCR, and will make available to eligible local governments approximately $10 million in funding for the 2023 program year for housing activities with the principal purpose of benefiting low moderate income persons. City of Batavia is applying for up to $500,000 in CDBG funds for a single family home rehabilitation program. The hearing will provide further information about the CDBG program and will allow for citizen participation in development of any proposed grant applications and or to provide technical assistance to develop alternate proposals. Comments on the CDBG program or proposed projects will be received at this time. The hearing is conducted section pursuant to section 570.486 subpart I of the CFR in compliance with requirements of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 as amended. Has anyone signed up? No. Does anyone like to speak? They forgot to sign up? Come right up. You, all I ask is that you state your name and address and limit your comments to the housing grant. Sure, thank you. Right My name is Leslie Moma. I live at 113 Summit Street. I've been a resident of Batavia, I guess, since 2017. Um, I don't have experience with the community development block grants here for the city of Batavia, but I do for the city that I lived in before, which was Rock Hill, South Carolina. And uh, we lived in a uh, mill village, which was 100 years old, um, was in decline. And having the city invest in our community through those small grants to help the residents do just some of those basic improvements. They also used the funding to help with our sidewalks, with our curbs, just to show that there was some tender loving care in our neighborhood. And it really made a difference for the residents. So I'm just asking that you do participate in this program. I know we have in the past, so we'd just like to say to continue to do that as well, because it is needed and it does make a difference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any council members? Motion to close public hearing. Mr. Canale, second by Mr. Beely. Call the roll, please. Councilmember Canale? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Schmidt? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Bajkowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. Veely? Yes. Twitchell? Yes. So item number one, the CDB, CDBG Housing Rehab Certifying Officer, the Seeker. Thank you, Council President. So the grant requires that the city move through the Seeker process um, and also that you appoint a certifying officer. In this case, we're looking to have that be Eric Fix. Um, he will be able to, through this resolution, sign off on all documents. And as we've already discussed, the grant is offered to help low to moderate single family homeowners make improvements. Eric, do you have anything to add? I think we've discussed it. But it's just an opportunity for me to push this forward through the grant process be the point person for the city. Any questions? Yes. Okay, so are we in consensus to move that to the next business meeting? Yes. 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 Thank you. The grant writing services for Lavella for the CDBG housing grant. Thank you, Council President. So during this year's budget, we had budgeted in the general fund $6,000 for types of grants um, we wanted to go after, which looking back was quite low. <laughs> looking at the list we have this evening. Um, so this resolution is actually asking council to move forward with applying for the grant and to appropriate uh, and recognize revenue from VLT funds, which we did receive this year, and $7,500 to apply for this grant. 
Questions so. or concerns on that? So we in favor to move that forward to the business meeting? Yes. See that gets moved. And the Labella grant writing for Austin Park. Um, as council will remember, when we first were allocated the ARPA funds, I came to council with a plan that included water and wastewater. There, we purchased um, a sewer camera, actually. That was something that was on their list for a long time. Because in the beginning, the money could only be used for water, wastewater, and or activities that promoted distancing. Uh, and we put Austin Park as a potential for that. Throughout time, as we got further along in the construction process or the bidding of the uh, BOM, Bureau of Maintenance, and Fire Department's project, we had to retract the funds for Austin Park so we could afford that capital project. Uh, we set that aside, but during the process, we did still have a master plan drawing, which you see in your packet, um, put together by LaBella, and we did find a grant opportunity that we could apply for in this grant round. So Eric, I'll let you go further with that. Yep, so there's a memo in your packet as well that, that talks about uh, the resolution, but similar to what we were talking about for the CDBG grant, um, this requires us to pay $5,000 for grant writing services, which is, exceeds our budget. So again, we're looking to take that money from the VLTA uh, so that we can, we can put forth that um, application. You will see in here, as Rachel mentioned, a copy of the master plan. We believe that with this money, our first, the first thing that we're going to tackle in that plan is to um, replace the existing playground into more of a more inclusive playground. Um, and if there is funding available after that, the next thing is to either rehab or replace the pavilion that is over there. And Labella actually has it being moved if we can afford it um, farther up closer to Washington Avenue. Um, so that's what we'd like to tackle with that grant if we were able to get it. It's a $500,000 grant with a 25% match by the city, um, which we would use DPW equipment reserves to help on our side for that if we're fortunate enough to get this grant. Any questions or concerns? So we in consensus to move that to the business meeting? Yes. Yes. That gets moved. Ice Rink Chiller Capital Project Authorization. Yes, so as we just discussed, the first resolution is asking council to update the capital project resolution and allow for a $2.5 million capital project to replace the Ice Rink Chiller at the Ice Arena. Questions or concerns on that? So are we in consensus to move that to the business meeting for an official vote? Can we, can we speed that up? Do we have to go to the vote, to the yeah. special meeting? No, can't. The public has to have two weeks to weigh in. Okay. And it's important. It's their eyes are too. No. So, I mean, that'll give us the time, right? We're still within the time frame. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we're talking about next year's eyes, technically. Right. Yeah, so I we're think talking that about the this year call we needed the answer by mid-July was what we kind of a go-no-go no go decision from the city because nobody can move forward with any type of planning until the decision right. is made, but uh, two more weeks is... is and, and we're shooting for, for April of next year. Correct, but we do need to do the engineering services right, right, right. and move through that process. And we need to be, do our, get our ducks in a row before we actually start the... Correct, and in order, order those long lead equipment pieces. Right. So this will be moved to the business meeting for a vote on the 10th, okay. which is just two weeks away. And then, then we'll have our long monthly meetings, but it'll already be in progress by then. Correct. Yep. Okay, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so we're in consensus to move that to the business meeting. Grant writing services for the ice cream chip. Yes. Thank you, Council President, members of Council. As I mentioned before, Genesee County um, came out with a program where they'd allow each municipality to apply for a grant and they would reimburse them. We chose, uh, back, way back in January, the ice chiller to be the grant we applied for. We'd like to recognize the revenue from that um, and the expense in the Community Development Fund. Questions or concerns on that? So we have consensus to move that to the business meeting. Yes. Yes. See that gets moved. The Climate Smart Communities Grant. 
Yes, so the last resolution related to the chiller in your packet um, is the permission to apply to climate smart communities. Um, it's basically saying we've identified 1.238 million of matching funds from NIPA's short-term financing, which we would move to a long-term bond, uh, and the application for the grant is 1.235 million. Um, I know last year, Clarence, or Williamsville got I think it was Clarence, um, did receive a $2 million grant for their ice plant um, at their rink. So we're very hopeful that um, we have enough information and a strong application to be successful. Any questions or concerns on that? Was it Amherst? Sorry. Was it Clarence? Williamsville? It was Amherst. So I had any questions on that? Going consensus to move that to the business meeting for a vote. Yes. Move. Rezoning of mixed place. Yes, thank you, Council President. Um, Ed Smart has petitioned the City Council to consider zoning change to mixed place and to add the words and other similar professionals to Section 190C2 of the Zoning Code. I'll let Brett Frank take over and talk a little bit more about what he intends to do with this project and why the rezone is requested. Yeah, so in your package, you'll see a memo and resolution referring the petition to rezone 134 mixed place to the Planning and Development Committee and to refer a zoning code update amending chapter 190C2, as Rachel said. Uh, so Ed Smart, who is the sole member of Plan Smart LLC, currently owns a parcel of land located in four mixed place. He has submitted a petition to rezone this parcel from an R1A to an R3 res residential designation. Uh, in addition, he's requesting a zoning code update to amend section 190C2 to read offices for attorneys, physicians, dentists, and other similar professionals not exceeding four offices in a single structure. Currently, the city code reads offices for attorneys, physicians, and or dentists not exceeding four offices in a single structure. Um, Four mixed place is not directly adjacent to the R3 district, um, and I would actually recommend that the city consider the parcels at one mixed place and three mixed place to also be included in the R3 rezone. Uh, both of those properties are currently owned by MJO Properties. One mixed place is a single family residence, while three mixed place is a two building, eight unit uh, apartment building. Uh, three mixed place is actually a prior non-conforming use in its current R1A uh, designation. Uh, and if this application were granted, it would bring three mixed place into zoning compliance as part of the R3 district. And just a little background on what Mr. Smart is looking to do. He intends to use four mixed place as his primary office for smart design architecture and to have either a one bedroom apartment or a second office for a separate professional uh, in the structure. That's what Mr. Smart is looking to do as far as that result. I also noticed he reached out to the neighborhood. He sent a letter out explaining what he was doing. Yeah. Did, we, did we get any feedback on that? Were people positive receiving this in a positive way? Or? I have personal feedback because I know three neighbors on Ellicott Ave who are very excited to see the house be yes. uh, kept up and put back on to some type of usable condition, but I can't say for all the residents. Well, it was I just, built in 1807, so it's got to be the oldest building in our city. He does say it's one of the oldest yeah, wood frame. If houses. it's not, it's pretty close. I mean, other than the Holland Land Office, it's yeah. got to be like one of the oldest yeah. structures. Yeah. yeah, so this is tonight just a referral to the planning. Yes. Right, yeah, we're just, so the planning can take a harder look at it and see. Right. But, um, how do the people at one and three feel about being in the zone? Well, it's funny that you bring that up. Those we do not have any feedback from. Uh, that was actually brought up uh, by his attorney that they had just been unresponsive into their inquiries about rezoning those two properties. Uh, so that is something that would probably be addressed by the Planning and Development Committee. I'm sure that's going to be one of the first questions that they do ask. Right. Um, Mr. Smart's attorney did ask that we move this forward um, regardless of that at this time. Right, yeah, because we can get it to the planning board. We still have time Correct. for an official vote. Yes. I think about as part of the process, is there a public hearing required someplace in the process yeah. of changing this? Yeah. Zoning change is a legislative function that's best in the council. But the process per the code is to refer it to the Planning and Development Committee for a review and recommendation, which they would make to council. Ultimately, council would have a decision as to whether or not to change the zoning map and code to conform with what is requested. So it's coming back to your, your group. 
So we'll go to the planning board, then back to us for a public hearing. Yes. And then through that process. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one. Okay. Yeah. Um, just run it by me again. Right now it's residential, and he's planning on using that existing house, that big home back there, for to, to be uh, partially to be used by his architectural business. And Correct. Okay. And so either have a one bedroom apartment or a second office for a separate professional in the structure. Okay. So, and then currently right now he employs 12 people, delivered to architectural and design services throughout the U.S. So he's got a pretty, he'll fill that up pretty good, just his business alone. So let's fast forward if we rezone it for what we need to rezone it for, for his purposes. What does that, I mean, that's a very large piece of property that goes behind a lot of Ellicott Avenue residents there. Um, what does that allow, what does the new zoning then allow him to do with that property? That will allow him to have his place of business in there and as well as a you know, one bedroom apartment or however he would like to do that. So that's Does it allow him in the future to put up a, a small apartment building back there of let's say six units? That I would have to defer to George. I don't know if you would know that off the top of your head. We have, I don't know that we can look specifically at what the setbacks are in that particular yeah. area. Again, for purposes of the rezoning, you're looking at the master land use. Does that land use comport with what the city's master plan would permit and allow for after review by the PDC? You're not necessarily looking at a specific user, you're looking at the land use. That's what PDC will do in conjunction with county planning is take a closer look at it and determine whether or not they feel they can recommend to the city council that that change be made to update the, the zoning map and code consistent with what was requested in the petition or not. So. Well, my, my concern, and, and it's my ward, uh, my concern would be that down the road, if we rezone it now, um, does that open it up for him to do something like that, like a four or six unit apartment? Does it open, up, does it open him up to uh, allow him to put some other type of commercial office or professional office back there. What does it allow him to I do? Believe, like I guess? believe that with a special use permit, he would be able to put up a multiple unit apartment building. So he would have to come to us first for a special use okay. permit. Uh, like but again, I said, setbacks I, I, are important. Yeah, it's yeah. that lot line. Yeah. It says in the memo here to, to read offices for attorneys and other professionals not exceeding four offices and a single structure. So it is limited to what he can do yeah. besides bulldozing it down and putting in a professional office building in there. If it's got more than four offices, it's gonna be in a total different zone and he would have to come back to get it resigned right. for that or an exemption. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've never been back there. I don't know how large that piece of property is, but it's, it's, it goes behind one, two, three of the uh, Three, four, five, six. I mean, his that total piece of property is 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 behind six properties on Ellicott Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's going to have a direct effect on those people. Right. I know some of those people have complained to me in the past, quite a few years ago. That isn't there anything we can do back there because they whoever the owners were just let it go right. and it was all right. overgrown. So I know that they'd probably be very welcoming to you know just cleaning it up at this point. I'm just concerned down the road as to how much can be put up on that. And, and there'll be a long, it'll be a process through the planning, through public hearings, and people have a chance to weigh in. Bob. Yeah. Uh, in the past, I, I believe the problem with that property was the sewer line. It was a privately owned sewer line, and that was an issue. I think that's why the property ended up just being in a state of dereliction. Is that still an issue, or has that been resolved? I don't have any of this. That, I mean, that we, we could look into, but that I don't know off the top of my head if it is or not. Well, according to his memo, somebody broke in and stole copper pipes and yeah. left a hole in the wall yeah. and did hundreds of thousands of dollars damage yes. for a few hundred dollars worth of copper yeah. and then left it unattended. And by the time they discovered it, it there's more weather damage oh, yeah. and age damage to the house that it's going to need extensive repair if he's tackling this make it into his offices, you know, that's the only way that building I think is going to get safe right. at this point. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's just going to run into the ground and it's just be going to be a shame. We shouldn't lose another old building. Right. Just just my thought. No, I agree. Anyone else that had it? So um, at this point, we're just moving into the planning board. We're still gathering more information. We'll get feedback from the public 
and especially out at Avenue, if it's going to affect people in their backyard, I'd like to hear from them, make sure they're okay with it. Right. So I totally understand that for sure. Uh, so are we in consensus to move this to planning, uh, forwarding it to the planning, to the vote, and the business meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that gets moved. Yes. License agreement with Depew Lancaster Railroad. Thank you, Council President. Before you have a license agreement uh, with Depew Lancaster Railroad in the city of Batavia to allow the Jackson Street water line to transverse the site, is that correct? Um, it'll allow the project we have through C CDBG, um, the Jackson Street water project, we received a grant last year for a million dollars to move forward to bid and construction. And Brett, do you have any? No, other add? than in order to move forward with the Jackson Street Water Project, this is something that has to be signed. Otherwise, we cannot actually go underneath that railroad. So, something that has to be signed to move forward with that project, which we're trying to get out to bid over the next month because CDBG funds should be used before the end of the year. So, any questions on that? Okay, we we'll consensus to move that license agreement with the railroad to the next business meeting. Yes, it gets moved. Sidewalk capital project? Yes. Um, Hart Norris and Fairmont Streets and Sidewalk Capital Project is an item that Scott, Allen, and Brett brought up about three weeks ago after they completed this year Madison, Dewey, Orleans, and Adams. They had funding left over from the state to touring route funds that New York State has had the last two years in the budget above and beyond what our normal CHIPS allocation was. So we would like to allocate that to this capital project, and I'll let Brett and Scotty give you more details. Yeah, absolutely. So you're, what you're looking at here is what we would call a complete street project, which would be Hart, Fairmont, Norris, as well as also do the sidewalks over on Madison. Uh, as Rachel said, we did Dewey, Orleans, Adam, Adams and Madison have all been milled and paved. Those are done this year. Uh, Madison's the only street of those four that have sidewalks, but this project would also um, be sidewalks, removal of some trees, planting of new trees if need be, um, road and sidewalks. Uh, so what we're looking to do is do those three streets with state touring route money that was supposed to go away last year, and we ended up getting about $541,000 worth of state touring route money. If you do a complete street project, the sidewalks become uh, state reimbursable as well. So this is a project we'd like to take some of those funds take streets that Scott actually has planned for next year forecasted and go ahead and get them done this year. So we would like to move forward with that project, get that engineered and get the ball rolling on that. I usually don't get this much ac action in my ward, but this is also, <laughs> this is, this is also in my ward. Now, when you say Hart Street, is that just Hart Street in that one block or is it Hart Street crossing over Bank Street to Tracy Avenue as well? That's, that's going to be from state to bank. State to bank. State just state that block yes, there. Correct. Right. Yep, and you'll see, now you look at State, Richmond, that'll kind of all start to blend together where we've had streets done, sidewalks done, where it's really kind of starting to come together, you know, in that area. And if you take down trees, please plant more. Because oh, absolutely. The, the one thing, I know Gino had, yeah. had um, mentioned it one other time, not that long ago, and it's, it, it bothers me too, the, a lot of the streets that we've redone, we had to take those trees down to save the, you know, because we were putting new sidewalks yeah. in, and we're trying to save the sidewalks, but we've got a lot of a lot of streets now with absolutely no canopy. Right. I grew up on Bank Street. Every time I go down Bank Street, which is at least once a day, I cringe because I remember it's Bank Street with the huge yeah. canopies of trees. <laughs> yeah, you, you feel like you blow a cannon down. So, the so is Hart Norris and Fairmont your legal firm? Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's what these guys, that's what they call it, the law firm project. Right. It sounds like a law firm, doesn't it? Hart Norris and Fairmont. Yeah. And Brett, this just, just involves milling and resurfacing, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then sidewalks and necessary. Okay. Yeah, it'll be replaced with four foot sidewalks where every 200 feet there will be a passing mill on that time. So. And how much is sidewalks per linear foot right now? More than I care to say. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of these funds, the 650000 yes. will be for the sidewalks. Can I just ask the question again, yeah. is how do you choose the places you choose? Because again, I drove down these streets and walked these mm -hmm. sidewalks, and the sidewalks in my ward are worse. So why do you choose, you know, I do, shouldn't we take the worst and then go well, from there? It's funny that you bring that up, because Scotty and his crew are actually in the process of going through street by street, checking sidewalks and coming up with the actual inventory as we move forward to kind of get 
do that in triage sidewalks uh, in the future for that. So that because what I'd like to see, I mean, all yeah. the sidewalk projects we've done since I've been on council and before, they're all on the north side of town. I mean, and there's never anything on the south side of town being done. We pay the same taxes. Uh, Madison did them uh, in, in that project, so yeah, South Main was done. So we're we're looking at but it. It's still just, not, and you know, I mean, I look at that one yeah. to you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then we exactly. just don't have like I said, that's why we're, that's why we're you know looking at everything and creating that inventory. And until we get that done, we're kind of you know moving forward with streets that were forecasted previous years and moving them ahead. But we are in the process of checking all those out. We uh, sooner rather than later we'll have that all put together and it's something that we can bring forward to council and kind of go over. Yeah. Well, we found the sidewalk guys. That's super bad. Hey Brett, have we have we done any sidewalks alone? Because it seems like most of the sidewalks we've done were because the streets needed to get done, so we did the sidewalks on those streets. That, that's kind of been the philosophy, and Scott, you can attest to this too, is that complete street approach where you are doing streets, then doing the sidewalks, doing some tree removal to kind of transform right. that whole neighborhood. But like, like Tammy was saying, most of the sidewalks on the south side, the streets are okay. It's the sidewalks and the curbs. It's, it's that old asphalt. Yep weird kind of curve and they're not holding up well and they're yeah, got some street funkiness too swan i mean i dodge i go it's down the streets good. every day so. yeah, Scott, i don't want to kind of touch base how we kind of forecast street sidewalks well, and we forecast them based on street condition and amount of deterioration both asphalt and concrete uh, basically we are updating <clears throat> a, a system that's been in place for 15 years and Doing it street by street, uh, I definitely can attest that your your board is in need of a little bit of attention. Sometimes I love and care for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, w once we get all the information compiled, we will come forth with uh, a forecast of X amount of streets in the order that we feel will be most advantageous for you. And I know Rachel and I had talked about that's always something we could put a little presentation together for. For city council and kind of go over what we found and you know plans moving forward so we'll be more than happy and we do have online the sidewalk map and the street map to show what has been done in what year and again sometimes it time goes by and all of a sudden what we thought was done <laughs> isn't isn't done anymore and we got to look back at it and, and another tough aspect too is every year the state funding is coming out later and later and later so we it's kind of a crap shoot, like we're going to have to kind of be under the gun to get this engineered and get it done prior to call it Halloween weather-wise. Um, so right. that's, that's kind of tough. Like we only got this May 2nd that we found out that we got that amount. So trying to move that along as quick as possible. So yeah. that always makes it interesting too. Right. <laughs> I get that. That's what special meetings are for. Yes. Yes. Any other questions or concerns? Okay, so we need consensus to move the Hart North and Fairmont sidewalk capital project and street project to the business meeting. Yeah. Main Street grant application. Thank you, Council President. The Batavia Development Corporation has just closed out. Congratulations, Tammy. The previous Main Street grant that the city was awarded in 2019, they were able to complete seven projects. Um, in downtown and they are looking to apply again this year uh, the application would come from the city but they're willing to pay for the grant writing services and do the administration um, tammy held a meeting with labella and ed flynn and we had over 10 building owners come to that meeting interested in seeking grant funds so we think that another application will be successful if you have any further up for follow-up questions, Tammy Hathaway is here from the BDC. Any questions on that? So we consensus to move that to the business meeting for a vote? Yep. Yes. Bid board member appointment. Yes, as we discussed at the previous meeting, um, the one board seat on the bid that council gets to approve, I believe you've nominated uh, Councilwoman Tammy Schmidt for that position, and you have the resolution before you. Yeah. Any questions on that? You're still ready, ready to 
reaction? The first meeting I'm going to go to is tomorrow morning. All right, so yes. <laughs> Even though I won't be official yet, they invite you. Yeah. You're so official we, enough. So yes. we consensus to move this to the next business meeting for a vote, so yes. it can be officially yes. on the committee? There you yes. Go. Revolving loan fund grant, Center Street Small House. Yes, thank you, Council President. So back in 2019, City Council approved a policy to allow funding from the uh, revolving loan fund to be split out and used for grant funds, um, specifically for building improvements only. So these grant funds are not for businesses, they're specific to buildings and infrastructure. Off the top of my head, I believe there have been eight or nine grant funds awarded, the first one being Guy Clark at Cedar Street, who built that new building um, to house some of his equipment in. Um, I know other recipients have been Plato Casey Law Firm, I believe Matt Gray got one, um, Go Art has as well, and they've all been very successful in completing projects here in the city. The latest application is from the Center Street Smokehouse. They have deteriorating brick on their building that they need to repoint. They've needed that for a while. They have some roof repairs that need to be completed and they want to redo their second floor patio facing into Jackson Square to freshen that up and um, look as nice as Matt's patio behind Eli Fish. So I'm bringing that for you for your consideration. The BDC um, committee scored it as well as the board and moved it on to city council. Any questions or concerns on that? No, move that. So we're in consensus to move that to the business meeting for a vote. Yes. Let's move. And the New York State Consolidated Funding application. Yes. Um, last year the city applied for a grant to replace water meters in the city to move to radio read water meters so we didn't need a member of our staff going up to the house to read the meters. Uh, it's been something that's been underway since, gosh, Jason was here in 2015-16. They started this replacement program. Um, we were unsuccessful with our grant last year, but we'd like to apply again this year and do need permission from city council to apply. This is in the budget. It's in the water fund budget to apply this year. Questions or concerns on that? So we have consensus to move that to the business meeting for the vote. Yes. Okay. Mr. Bealy, take us into executive session, please. Thank you, Council President. Whereas Article 7, Section 105.1D of the Public Officers Law permits to the legislative body of a municipality to enter executive session to discuss proposed pending or current litigation, now, there, now therefore be resolved by the Council of the City of Batavia, that upon approval of this motion, the City Council does hereby enter into executive session. Second by experience. Call the roll, please. Council Member Bealey? Yes. Twitchell? Yes. Canale? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Schmidt? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Bajkowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. 